Hi, this is Pat Bruff from Fink and Paris Insurance Agency. Welcome to our podcast, Local and Mighty, the podcast about Massachusetts personal and commercial insurance in plain English, mixed in with a little bit of fun. Hello again, and welcome to episode 10 of the Fink and Paris podcast, Local and Mighty. It's me again, Pat Bruff, and this episode is being recorded in early December of 2020, and the holidays are slowly uh, approaching, actually quickly approaching, because the holidays, once Thanksgiving's uh, here, then, you know, all of a sudden it's, it's going to be Christmas and New Year's. Uh, this episode is uh, going to focus on fire safety in the home. My guest today is someone that is very familiar with fire safety in the home and other and businesses, actually. And that is Chris Norris, the chief of the East Hampton Fire Department. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Hi, good morning, everyone. So, uh, Chris, thank you for coming in. Uh, I typically start all of these podcasts by giving our guests a chance to tell us who they are, how they got here. Uh, whether hopes and dreams. No. <laughs> all right, maybe not their hopes and dreams. But tell us how you got here. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Chris. Absolutely. So um, I actually got involved in the fire service uh, starting back in April of 1994 uh, in my hometown of West Hampton. I was approached by the fire chief at the time, Richard Tracy, and I was asked to uh, be one of the members of the volunteer department. And uh, so I, that got me going down that path of uh, the fire service. And I found out that I, I really enjoyed it. I liked that hands-on practical component, being outdoors, the physical activity and giving back and helping the community. Mm -hmm. And after a few years helping out West Hampton, I started taking some of the entry-level firefighter exams. And in August of 2000, I started full-time for the city of Northampton. Um, I worked there for the past 20 years, uh, working up through the ranks as a firefighter, a captain. Uh, and I finished there as the senior deputy fire chief and one of their paramedics. Uh, and I ended my career there back uh, this past July when I took the full-time uh, fire chief's position in the city of East Hampton. So Excellent. I've been in East Hampton now, uh, coming up on uh, just about five months. Wow. Time so, flies, doesn't it? Time flies. <laughs> uh, it, it's been a, a great time. Um, you know, looking back at the fire service in my career, um, in addition to the, the volunteer time, uh, my time in Northampton, I also spend uh, a lot of time at the State Fire Academy. Okay. I, I've been teaching there since 2003. And uh, currently, I'm the statewide coordinator for their call volunteer recruit firefighter training program. And in that program, we teach six classes a year across the entire state just for call and volunteer firefighters. So we graduate about over 300 uh, firefighters uh, each year in, in that program. Wow. wow. So, that, so that takes up a little time, but um, it's certainly fun and beneficial seeing uh, a lot of those people strive to uh, get into the profession as well. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. So I grew up in, I did not grow up in East Hampton for those who do not know. Um, but I grew up in uh, Vernon, Connecticut, Rockville, Connecticut. Yep. And actually it was a, a huge volunteer, uh, program there that they had. And, uh, so I used to, uh, I had a friend whose brother was on the volunteer fire department. Uh, some of you know, I like to take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, I was there, you know, unofficial, uh, like I am here sometimes for you guys, uh, unofficial photographer where I took pictures and, and, Follow them around whenever there was uh, crazy stuff, but I didn't realize we had a lot of volunteer organiz or volunteer fire uh, departments here in the state. I didn't realize that. Yeah, and in fact, one of the benefits of that uh, is uh, com comes out with East Hampton is you look at the surrounding communities. For example, West Hampton and South Hampton. Um, West Hampton, as I alluded to earlier, they're all volunteer, mm -hmm. and then South Hampton has call members. So having the ability to train those uh, types of individuals. Uh, they come in mutual aid and help provide services to East Hampton from time to time in larger incidents. Mm -hmm. So it, it's also a benefit to East Hampton helping to uh, train some of those call volunteer firefighters around the state and in wow. the region. Yeah, interesting. That's cool. Very so, cool. So uh, how did I rope you into doing this uh, is probably what you're asking, uh, or at least Pete, the folks that are listening are asking. Uh and I will say that we can totally blame Facebook for this one. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and people responding, actually. And you happen to be one of those people who responded. But we'll get into that in just a little bit. Uh, before we do that, though, the holiday season is here. Uh, and I wanted to start talking about some of the holiday basics. I'm sure, sadly, every year – or actually, see every year uh, across the country during the holidays, there are lots of fires that could be avoided. Uh People love to put up their Christmas uh, decorations this time of the year, and and there's a lot of things that are done. 
that unfortunately lead to, you know, tragedy sometimes. Uh, and I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, I'm going to let you jump in here to tell me some of the things that we should talk or we should let our list listeners know uh, what they can do to avoid, you know, any kind of uh, danger in the home when it comes to the holidays and decorations and kind of what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. This time of year around the holidays, we typically see with a lot of people putting uh, Christmas trees, holiday trees inside their homes, um, a bunch of reminders we try to get out to the public on a regular basis. The first one obviously is continually to water that tree. Yeah. What happens a lot of times is people will go for long durations of not watering the tree. It starts to dry out and then that fire hazard just increases. Yeah. The recommendations out there for people with those holiday trees are to water it daily. Um, if you can water it daily, that obviously will uh, not allow it to dry out mm -hmm. and become more of a fire hazard and fuel load inside of the home. Sometimes we get questions as to what do we recommend? Do we recommend the artificial trees or the real trees? And obviously the artificial trees do provide a safer level of uh, fire safety within the homes mm -hmm. because it doesn't have that uh, fuel load that the uh, real tree does inside the house. I mean, and when you say fuel load, you mean it's not going to burn as quickly. So it, it, like, exactly. I mean, we've seen the videos there. I bet you will see over the next couple of weeks, the, the videos of, uh, you know, a tree, they go up. Like it's crazy how fast they can go up, especially if they're dry. In, in a matter of seconds, um, if those catch fire, those go up, contribute to the overall fire load within mm -hmm. the home. Um, and then it just continues from there. Yeah. The other ones that we get a lot of questions about is the Christmas lights. Mm -hmm. and, and I always recommend based on uh, best practices, anytime you're not in the home, turn all the lights off. Okay. Nowadays, there certainly are safer um, lights out there. The LED lights aren't as done. They don't get as hot as the older ones. Mm -hmm. But just as a matter of good practice, we tell people when you're not home, turn the lights off so you don't have that potential ignition source when you're not there. And then I think the other one we get a lot of questions about when people are putting <clears throat> up a lot of decorations is the use of extension cords. And in, <laughs> and in particular, yeah. um, those power strips. Yeah, yeah. And certainly we, we do not recommend the use of those. Yeah, yeah. Chris, you remember the movie Christmas Vacation, it, remember exactly. that? <laughs> like I just was starting to think of that as we're talking about this. You know, yeah, absolutely. 8,000 uh, plugs into one little outlet there. <laughs> yeah, and if uh, by all means we certainly... And if the cat gets it, then it's yeah, done. Yeah, <laughs> keep the cat away from the electricity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you can go directly into a GFI outlet um, yep. directly with the core that certainly is uh the safest method to uh um, power all of these lights that are out there all right and, and so, then the so last power, you can use power strips but just don't use like 20 of them you don't you don't no, need you 20 know. of them plugged into right. each other and right. creating a chain across the entire house. right 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 same thing with outside too i would imagine that could be even more dangerous with with water if it you know rain or, or whatever if you're using outdoor that is, Lighting. that is correct. And there, there's different uh, outdoor ratings for uh, utility cords and okay. lights and things of that nature just to be aware of also. Mm -hmm. And then I think the last one that we get questions on is candles. Yeah. And um, certainly people like to have the ambiance of candles and things of that nature. But uh, certainly um, we tell people, number one, obviously don't leave them going at nighttime. Don't leave them going when you're not home. <laughs> And if you can, if you have to have candles in the house, if you can buy the candles that are uh, contained within like a glass container okay. and not the freestanding ones mm -hmm. that may actually tip over on themselves. And then lastly, they talk about that circle of safety. Okay. Um, and they use a guideline of about three feet. You want to keep any combustible materials a minimum uh, at least three feet away from those candles. Okay. So, you know, talking about that. You know, where, where you put your tree is obviously important, um, or maybe even, uh, you know, kind of jumping back to the tree, um, you know, heaters, people are using, you know, heaters as it starts to get cold. Um, so you definitely want to, as you, what did you call it? The three foot, what is the that? The three foot uh, circle of safety. <clears throat> right. So you want to make sure that, you know, that tree is not anywhere near there, especially if you're going to leave and then leave the heater on, there's, there's a chance, you know, there, there could be a fire that way. Exactly. Any heat source like that, we certainly encourage again to keep that distance away from that tree. Yeah. Um, as, yeah. as you go through the holidays and curtains and all of that stuff. There, like, there's, there's, there's so much potential in there. And that's why we, 
you know, opportunities like this to continue to get the message out in different forums Mm -hmm. is great for a reminder for people. Yeah. And so again, we want everyone to have a safe holiday season. Uh, Actually, we want everyone to be safe all the time, but uh, you know, especially during the holidays, uh, especially when there's these added exposures, you want to make sure that you're, you're doing the best you can, right? Absolutely. Uh, All great things. And uh, I think, uh, I, I think about, uh, you know, holiday safety is, you know, one of the, one of the important things that, uh, people sometimes forget during the holidays and we have a lot of other stuff going on in the world right now. So we often, uh, we, we forget those things. Uh, there are many times in the year when we hear tragic, tragic stories about fires and, uh, it's just important to try and do the best thing, the best that we can. So with that being said, let's circle back to, uh, our Facebook, uh, discussion. (laughs) So, um, how did this all start and, and what happened? Uh, some of you know I like to use Facebook a little. Uh, I, I've been known to post a, a thing or two. And about a week or so ago, I posted a Sunday project that I was doing at the house that including included uh, replacing my just about 20-year-old smoke detectors in the house. This is where you go, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was twitching when I read it. Yes, yes. Uh, little did I know this would lead to uh, several replies, uh, including texts from uh, not just you, the fire, the current fire chief, but I also did get a text or two from the uh, the the past fire chief, Dave Motter, uh, who reminded me that. Uh, that that that's not a good idea. <laughs> and I also got a text or two from uh, a few of the guys uh, from the department, as well as uh, several realtors who are very well versed in what needs to go in a house when they're selling it as far as uh, smoke detectors. Uh, so again, little did I know this would turn into kind of a big deal because uh, here I was thinking I was doing this good thing for my family, even though I was, you know, 10 years late, you know, how sometimes you know, you got that that list of things you got to get done. And sometimes you say, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I get to it. And then, uh, you know, I got to it. It just took me a little longer than it should have, actually. <laughs> uh, but I did know that we needed to replace re- replace the detectors. But little did I know, I was uh, I didn't actually do such a great job. <laughs> uh, so what the heck did I do wrong, Chris? Give me, give me. Let's let's see where I started. Well, we're going to lead off this conversation with you did this intentionally to stimulate this conversation to educate the public. <laughs> we'll start yes. off with that. Yes, it was a marketing ploy. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what it was. No, I I think uh, one of the things that drew my attention to it was when you posted that it had been twenty years. Yeah, and. Th- Unfortunately, I think that is the norm. And as people become more educated through different means, such as this podcast, yep. um, we try to get out the message that um, it's highly recommended now with the current technology available that uh, I have to say, based on manufacturer's recommendations, mm-hmm. that uh, they're looking at having smoke detectors replaced uh, at least uh, within every 10 years okay. uh, based on keeping up with the technology, making sure the sensors inside those detection units um, stay sensitive and sensitized to the environment uh, that it's placed. Mm -hmm. So that initially is what drew my attention to your post was that 20 year mark that you threw out there. (laughs) Uh, Which I, yeah, I I knew it was well over. And I think I I just started to think about this as far as the timeframe. I bet you over the last five or six years. I know that doesn't help my case at all because uh, I should have done it five or six years ago. Um, but I, I have through, uh, you know, through social media and through just public awareness from from fire departments that you, you got to fix it. You can't just leave them there forever. Yeah, you can't leave them there forever. There's different means that the state has in place mm-hmm. um, to allow fire departments to get in there and assist the homeowners with uh, getting these uh, tested, getting them checked, yep. and um, making sure they comply with a lot of the state laws that pertain to both carbon monoxide and smoke detectors. Okay. Um, this time of year, within the past month, the East Hampton Fire Department made a big promotional push pertaining to carbon monoxide. Okay. One of the challenges with carbon monoxide, it's an odorless, colorless gas that can only be detected by a meter and device. Mm-hmm. And tragically, back in March of 2006, there was a young girl that uh, died out in Eastern Mass Ugh. that led to Nicole's Law. Yeah. And Nicole's Law basically states that um, on every habitable level, 
um, within these residences, you have to have um, a carbon monoxide detector mm -hmm. um, just for those reasons for it can only be, de be detected by that meter and device. Mm -hmm. um, so when we go in there and do our inspections as part of home sales in particular, mm -hmm. we're looking not only for the smoke detectors, which we'll talk about in a minute, but also the carbon monoxide detectors um, just for that <clears throat> particular reason. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the new technology. So I, I will tell you, I went into a uh, large big box store. I, I went around the house and I counted one, two, three, four, five, six. I have about seven, I think, uh, I think it was seven, eight actually, uh, smoke detectors in the house. Now our house was built, uh, back in 2000 and, uh, we actually hardwired the smoke detectors, which, uh, uh, we thought was you know, the best way to do it. And I, I don't remember if that was actually a code at the time, but I knew we needed smoke detectors. So. You, you, you're under the code. You are correct. <laughs> all right, good. So so we had that, them hardwired in. Uh, we know they all work because um, luckily uh, over the years, we've only had, I bet you twice, I think that they've gone off. And thankfully, both times we were like, what the heck's going on? It was dust or spider or something, or maybe they were old. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when they do go off, when they're hardwired, when one goes off, they all go off in the, in the entire house, you know, scaring the crap out of everyone, which is supposed to do to get you out. <laughs> right. And so, so and, and that's a good point to kind of start talking about the difference between the hardware capabilities and those that are not interconnected. Okay. Um, the, the building code and the fire alarm uh, codes changed back in 1997 that actually required um, for the first time for those under new construction mm -hmm. to have all the smoke detectors hardwired and interconnected. So to your point, talking about when one goes off, they all go off. Yeah. Because obviously if you have these, if you have a, a fire in the basement and you're up on the second or third floor, you may not know about right. it until it's too late. You may sleep through it. Exactly. Fortunately, you know. So that was the concept and reasons as to why back in 97, what that was one of the reasons they made the code change to have them all uh, interconnected. Okay. Uh, there's really five different tiers when you look at um, smoke detectors in terms of when the house was built or when the building permit was obtained, what tier those smoke detectors need to fit under. Mm -hmm. So for example, we're talking about anything after 1997 needs to be hardwired. Prior to 1975, you did not have to have hardwire detectors. It was only battery operated. Okay. So again, you could have that one detector go off in the basement. Right. And not have that one on the second floor activate at all. Yeah. Um, so. Which I'm sure led to, you know, unfortunate situations where, you know, people may have died because they didn't have the chance, you know, the time. The fire was able to grow right. so much faster because of the um, lack of notification or that quicker response. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we go in there and do these inspections, one of the first questions we ask homeowners or realtors is what year was the house built or when was the building permit uh, taken out? And that will base our decision on the compliance as to where the detectors need to be located and what types of detectors they need to have. Okay. I think kind of that leads into the other part of the conversation you and I had was there are different detectors that are out there. Um, you have a photo, uh, you have a photovoltaic, uh, 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 sorry, photoelectric, <laughs> um, photoelectric type detector, and yep. you have the ionization type detector. Yep. And the thing we try to stress with those two different types of detectors, the photoelectric detector, that picks up more of your smoldering types fires, um, where you have more smoke generated from the type of fire. Okay. Where the ionization smoke detector, that picks up more of your, um, the free burning, flaming types of fires that are out there. Right. One of the challenges you talked about, some of the false alarms that people have, mm -hmm. a lot of those have been sometimes contributed to the ionization type detectors. Those are more apt to pick up sometimes. Um, the steam or the cooking smoke yeah. um, if they're pra placed in the wrong location within the house. Okay. So right now, um, if people, the law basically reads that if you have a detector within 20 feet of a bedroom or a kitchen, it's supposed to be a photoelectric detector. Okay. That way they you minimize the potential mm -hmm. for those nuisance alarms. All right. And, and so again, I went to that, uh, big box store. And when I walked in there, I, I started looking around and there, there, interestingly enough, 
are a, a lot of smoke detectors. There's a there. ton out there. there. There really are. And a lot of them that'll talk to you and tell you what's going on. And I'm sure probably hooked to my phone and all these other things. But when I went in there, I said to the guy, I actually brought one with me because I knew it was hardwired. I needed to make sure that, hey, I, this is the, you know, this is the connection that I have for right. my smoke detector at home. I need to replace like seven or eight of them. What do I need? He walked me over to, the, you know, <laughs> where those were. They were like, look brand new to me. <laughs> yep. And he said the only issue that, um, which I thought, okay, well, maybe these must be the right ones or they must be newer because the one thing that he said I had to do was the, the actual connections are different. So there, there's uh, the plug that goes into the back. I had to, actually had to um, take out the old one and replace it with a new one um, so that I could get it to connect properly. And uh, so again, I bought you know a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, and no, and and that's not uncommon. Um, a lot of people, again, particularly with the time span we're talking about, the twenty years, um, working with a uh, professional contracted electrician to come in and maybe change the plugs out for the connections to meet the current technology. Mm-hmm. The other thing that we try to make people aware of based on the code is now with the new detectors that are out there, they're not only hardwired, but they're also battery backup. So obviously in the event of a power failure, you still have that proper protection throughout your entire residence. Yeah. And the newer technology out there, the old adage of change your clock and change your battery. That's on my list here to that, talk to you about. See, I'm already ahead of the game. <laughs> um, that actually has changed now. So it's no longer change your clock and change your battery. It's change your clock and check your batteries. Yeah. Because the newer technology has those 10-year um, lithium ion batteries. Yeah. That certainly um, last throughout uh, that full period. So I will say um, in my not real good defense, but just some kind of defense that I did actually, I know that the smoke detectors that I had were not CO detectors. You know, they, they didn't, they weren't capable of that. So I at least knew that. And I know that in my house, we actually have had uh, one for the longest time. And this time they had some kind of sale. So I bought actually two of them um, to put one down in the basement uh, near the, the heat source, which you can, we'll get to where should they all be in a second, but yep. You could tell me, oh, God, Pat, really? <laughs> um, but I put one there and one there. But as I was opening them and reading them, I was like, oh, where's the where's the battery? I think there was just a thing to pull out, if I remember correctly, like one of those tabs. Um, but I actually can't get to the battery. It basically says it's a 10-year battery. Press this to check it. Make sure it works because um, I think they want you to replace it. Again, I think it's maybe helping with that. We'd rather you replace it than just put in a new battery because there could be something else wrong. Exactly. And that is the thought process behind the design yeah. is with that 10-year battery, it should last the lifespan of the detector. Yeah. <laughs> so when the battery or the unit is no longer working, that's kind of that clue and indicator that, okay, not only do I need to replace the battery, but probably the unit needs to uh, be fully replaced as well. Yeah. So, so tell me about... Um, uh, CO detectors. Tell Just tell me a little bit about those and how they're different. And actually, the other thing is uh, we'll kind of jump into where should my smoke detectors be? Now, I know that they're all high, hardwired. And I know when they built the house, somebody came in and goes, that's where they're supposed to be. So other than ones that I'm putting in by myself that are battery operated, where where should they be? And give me the code, maybe that's the easiest way. Yeah. So at least so starting with the carbon monoxide. Um, the carbon monoxide detectors, they want on every level of the residence, including any habitable portions of the basement and actually even the attics as well. Okay. Um, the other thing we try to explain in regards to that is not only do you have to have them on every habitable level, but they want them within at least 10 feet of all the bedrooms. Because when you think about it, some of the symptoms um, from carbon monoxide, it makes people drowsy and sleepy. So when you go to bed at night, if you don't have the detector immediately in that area, then you may just fall asleep. Right. And it's colorless, uh, odorless. Exactly. Like exactly. You're not going to know. So that is part of the code as well as having those carbon monoxide detectors on all of those levels and particularly within 10 feet of those bedrooms. Mental note, go buy another CO detector. Go buy another <laughs> CO detector. <laughs> okay. Um, and then when you start talking about the smoke detectors, Again, you're looking at a minimum, and again, we base it on the year that the house was built or the permit was taken, Mm -hmm. but what you see typically is you're going to have these detectors at the base of all the stairs, um, including in the basement itself, Mm -hmm. 
and then they talk about having them in the hallways as well. It was interesting that the code changed again back in 1997, where any house built after 1997 also has to have smoke detectors inside of every bedroom now as well. Okay. Oh, wow. And that's still the case as of today. Yeah. And they are in our house. I know that. Yep. The smoke detectors are all. And, and again, with with people going to sleep with the doors closed, they may not hear those. So now you have a detector inside the bedroom. It's interconnected. Mm -hmm. So if one goes off, they all go off. And it was more apt to wake you up uh, for that reason. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's what we're, you're looking at in terms of just some of the general um, layouts and uh, locations for some of those detectors are out there. Okay. And then the other one that we like to tell people in the newer construction is um, any house built after 2008, they have to have, if they have an attached garage or a garage underneath their house, yep. they also have to have a heat detector that's interconnected with those smokes as well. Because All right. if you have a, a vehicle malfunction in there, mm -hmm. you want to alert the occupants inside the house as well. Another mental note. <laughs> <laughs> so again, there was a, uh, th th interestingly enough, uh, uh, in, in my true confession time to the fire chief, <laughs> uh, the, the smoke detector, I did replace the one in our garage because we do have a, uh, an attached garage. We have a living space above it. Yep. And uh, it did have a smoke detector in there. I did go and replace it, but I thought it was interesting as I looked at that particular smoke detector, it was slightly different than the ones in the house. Um, and when I mean slightly, it looked like it had a little cage over the the area where the detector part is. Yep. So I'm sure that is exactly why. Yeah. So mental note. Gotta, yep. Gotta so you want to replace that, that one, one as well. <laughs> replace that one too. So again, it's a learning experience, right? And Absolutely. that's what we're doing for everyone here. Right? And, and again, we've really tried in the past five months or so to continue the uh, public outreach and education yeah. in regards to carbon monoxide, in regards to smoke yeah. detectors. Um, we're fortunate where anytime people have a resale of their house, um, state law allows us to go in there during this resale period as part of the closing process and issue a um, permit. Uh, and that permit basically says that the certificate of compliance uh, meets all the current rules and regulations for smoke detectors and, and carbon monoxide. Okay. Um, so that certainly is a huge help to continue to increase the safety right. of people throughout the community. Hence, all of my realtor friends calling me That's going, exactly Pat, it. what are you doing? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And they, they, uh, one of them said she spends, uh, you know, half of her, uh, half of her week, uh, getting new smoke detectors and CO detectors for people when they're selling their houses and they're closing because they know that you guys are coming in to, to do these inspections. So, uh, let's jump into, uh, real quick, uh, the smoke detectors are there and the CO detectors are there for a reason, obviously. Uh, what's your plan? Uh, so talked a little bit about, I, I, I know we have a little bit of a plan at our house. It's get out, run. Yep. <laughs> um, we're lucky. Uh, we live right next door uh, uh, to family. So our meeting point is outside and uh, 100 feet to the right is the, you know, is uh, Bobchi's house. Uh, get over there. So t tell me a little bit about um, the planning or what people should do as far as, you know, having a family plan to get out. Yeah, no, perfect. And, and that is great to hear. I, I think the first thing we always try to lead off with is, Tell people not to get complacent anytime they hear an alarm. Um, we talked earlier about the false alarms and some of the reasons behind those. And unfortunately, that does lead to complacency. And anytime people hear an alarm go off, they should consider it to be an ingenuine alarm to go quickly investigate as to the cause. And then certainly if they find that there's uh, a fire of any type to immediately call 911, they want to evacuate the house immediately, get everyone out of the house. Mm -hmm. And then like you spoke about is go to a uh, designated spot where they can meet all the people inside of that house. So in terms of accountability, when we arrive on scene, the very first thing we want to know is everyone out and safe. Right. Because if not, that changes our tactics mm -hmm. as to what we need to prioritize when we first get there. Okay. And then the other component that we really try to emphasize, particularly to, to kids and younger adults, is once you're out, stay out. Don't go back inside the house. Um, tragically, we've seen um, instances across the country where people have gotten out 
and they go in just to get a, a picture, a family right. picture or, or um, a pet. A, a pet. Yeah. And um, that that is unfortunately led to many tragedies. So once you get out, stay out of that house. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then when the fire department gets there, um, let us know who's out and accountability. And again, we can uh, base our, our tactics on that. From there. Yeah. So any, uh, any last uh, tips for us as far as uh, picking out smoke and carbon monoxide detectors that uh, folks should do or think about before they, they venture on their next Sunday project? No, there's a lot of good, reputable, different types of uh, brands that are out there uh, in terms of both smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Um, you can find them anywhere at your local hardware dealerships here in the city or some yep. of the big box stores. Yep. Um, and certainly we encourage people if they have questions, please call the fire department at any time. Yep. I got to give my plug right now to Captain Dan Constantine, um, our full-time fire prevention officer who does a tremendous job and uh, has always gone above and beyond to help the community if they have questions prior to their closing for a resale. Um, he'll meet with them, go out there, and walk through the, the codes. And then also in regards to if they just have general questions, um, reach out to the fire department, and we're happy to uh, meet with people at any point. Noted. <laughs> anytime. All great. Anytime. So, again, this is all uh, great information, obviously, uh, from the insurance side of things. Uh, we want everyone to have uh, good working smoke detectors, uh, CO detectors in their house to make sure everyone is safe. safe. Also, uh, it's also good to have insurance. Um, I try not to really be sales pitchy uh, during these, these things because I want it to be fun. I want it to be informative. Uh, but folks that are renting should talk to an insurance agent. Uh, it breaks my heart. Uh, every year or, you know, all the time, not just uh, during the holidays, but when you see a fire, um, especially during the holiday season, it's really tough to see a family or, or folks that are just, uh, living by themselves that rent, uh, and there's a fire there that, you know, destroys everything they have and, and they just have no coverage, uh, for simple as two to $300 a year, you can get coverage that will cover your belongings, a place for you to stay liability. And of course, uh, uh, nobody ever thinks it's going to happen to them until it does. And that's just, it's just a, it's a, it's tough to see, especially during the holidays. It's really tough to see. With that being said, this ties into the end of our episode where we feature a little spot that I like to call, That's Just Not True. <laughs> this is the part of the episode that features one of the things we hear from our customers or we read on the internet about insurance that is just not true. Today, uh, today's version of That's Just Not True is about renter's insurance. We have people come in all the time, or we at least talk to people, or even worse, after a fire, we hear people say, um, there was a fire, and I don't I don't need to have insurance because my, my landlord's going to pay for everything. He's going to put me up for a place to stay, and he's going to replace all my stuff that was damaged, and, and, and I'll be fine. Um, so I don't, I don't understand why I need to have this coverage. Well, I can tell you for sure that that is just not true. You should always ask your landlord before moving in to make sure you – or you make sure that you read your lease to see if the landlord will cover any of your belongings. And guess what, Chris? That's just not true. It's just they, not true. They will just not – they're they're not going to do that. Unless you have uh, – unless your landlord is your mom or dad, then uh, chances are you might have some coverage. But if you are renting, uh, typically you are not going to have – your landlord is not going to cover your, your belongings. Uh, and some of them uh, might have tenant re relocation, um, and that's a big might, uh, should you be di displaced from where – displaced from the apartment. But – there's a good chance that they don't. And so at the end of the day, there's a fire, you're, you're going to be out. I'm sure you've all seen uh, the commercials on TV where you can bundle your bundle your home and auto. Well, an, an apartment insurance is kind of along the same ways. You can bundle that coverage. And so one of the other things is it, it, it really is not that much uh, for this kind of coverage. But people always ask me, like, how do we pick that coverage? And I... I so renter's insurance is, is a little bit different than a homeowner's policy where we come up with a figure for a replacement cost for the house. A renter's policy is something that we we ask you, hey, Chris, um, you're renting this apartment and um, 
how much stuff, how much coverage do you want? You can actually pick the coverage. So I say to you, what do you, what do you have in your apartment? And so what are the things that pop into your head when I, when I ask you, uh, let's say you're a, a young, uh, 20 something who's renting an apartment. What do you think you have as far as how much money and stuff do you have in your apartment? What are the first couple things that you think of? At 20 years old, I didn't have much in my apartment. <laughs> yeah, but you probably had a TV. <laughs> the TV and the couch and a recliner. Couch, and... recliner. Yeah. And so everyone does that same. They do the exact same thing. They say, oh, I got a computer. I got a TV. I got a couch. And, and that's about it. And they don't really worry about it. But I, what people forget is that most, not all, actually probably most 20-year-olds don't have a lot of stuff. But in general, um, when you start thinking about your apartment, you don't just have a TV, a couch, and a recliner. You also have things like clothes. <laughs> so if you know there's a fire and you get out with whatever it happens to be you're wearing and the fire destroys your apartment, you have no more clothes. So there's there's clothes. There are pots and pans, medicine. If you, if you're, you know, you have some kind of uh, condition where you have to take medicine and all of your medicine is in the cabinet and now, now there's a fire. None of that medicine is any good anymore. So food, pots and pans, uh, you know, food, uh, most 20 year olds probably don't have food in their apartment either. (laughs) I know I didn't. I had a lot of ramen, (laughs) a lot of ramen. That's why we went and visited mom and dad. Exactly. Exactly. So these things can add up quickly. So again, even if you, get a policy for $25,000, $30,000 worth of stuff. And again, I, you can get to that number really, really, really quickly. Um, and, and the premium is two to $300 a year. As I said to somebody the other day, that's almost what you're paying for Netflix. So, <laughs> and, and you'll be able to, you know, recoup and get back to your, you know, get back on track um, in the event of a fire. And I'm sure you see this uh, all the time, Chris. I'm sure you, unfortunately, you guys pull up to a fire and then once the fire's out, you start talking to people and, and they just don't have, they don't have anything. Everything's lost and they don't have any insurance. So it's it's not a good thing. No, a- absolutely. And that certainly is uh, added just to the tragedy of them s- seeing them lose a structure yeah. and all yeah. the contents that are inside of that. So. Yeah, Absolutely. All right, so that's it. That is a wrap of this episode. We hope you we, we made it fun and informative, and please take a minute to subscribe to our podcast, share it with anyone you think would benefit from listening. I want to, again, thank you, uh, Chief Norris, for coming and connecting with us to make this happen. I really appreciate it. Any, any uh, last-minute parting things you'd like to throw out there? No, absolutely. Uh, greatly appreciate the invite, and everyone have a happy holiday season and stay safe out there. Absolutely, you too. And remember, if you are, here comes the sales pitchy part. If you are looking for insurance here in Massachusetts for your home, auto, or any commercial operations, we can find you can find us at insuringyourway.com and of course on any of our social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. If you are listening, make sure you stay safe, wear a mask, practice social distancing. And thank you for listening to the Fink and Paris podcast, Local and Mighty. Have a great day.